Hello and thanks for watching today. My name is Spencer Siddons and I'm a biology graduate student at Purdue University. I study amphibian ecology and conservation. And I'm excited to tell you guys and show you the local amphibian diversity in our area, such as right here at Martell Forest. So today we're gonna to focus on identifying a few of the local, more common amphibians in our area. So you can use this information to better connect with nature, to enjoy the outdoors more, to impress your friends, and also this skill can be used to provide information to scientists like myself studying the status of amphibians. Because currently right now, amphibian populations all over the globe are decreasing for a number of reasons, such as climate change, habitat destruction, and disease. So it's important that citizens and scientists work together to cover a much larger area than I could by myself to track these populations. So what you can do with this information in identifying the local amphibian species is take that information and upload it to an online database that scientists such as myself can use to analyze the status of these populations. So we'll get started. Um, essentially what we'll do is we'll be able to go to a pond, find a frog like this green frog here, and I'll describe the best characteristics that you can use to identify it visually by looking at this frog and also by listening for its call. And then you can use a couple programs such as Frog Watch and Herp Mapper to upload pictures or audio files up to those programs and that information can be freely available to anyone uh, that has internet access and you can be of great help to scientists all over the globe to help better understand, manage, and conserve these great species in our area. Uh, so I'm just going to let her go and we'll get started. Okay, so this is the green frog. This is a very common frog found throughout most of Indiana. It's a species in the family of true frogs, so kind of the classic, typical looking frog. The big hind legs, ah, oh, easy buddy. Uh, the big hind legs there for, for large jumps. Uh, the extensive toe webbing on their back feet so they can swim uh, more easily. They occupy these permanent ponds um, all year round, so they're, they're very linked to the water, so they're swimming around quite often. Uh, you can hear them calling in the background, which is a beautiful sound. We'll, we'll let them continue on with that. Uh, the way to identify these frogs beyond their call, which I'll get to in a little bit, is the coloration. So they have this kind of light to dark brown back, um, can oftentimes even be green. You can see the green head on this one, and then a white belly. And that yellow on the throat, you see that yellow, that's representative of a male. So a male will develop a more yellow throat during the breeding season, which is the summertime, as you can hear. Um, hear them calling. They'll get that yellow throat to help attract females. Um, it's a brighter coloration, more attractive, um, more likely to then breed and, and pass on their genes. Um, there is one similar species, very similar species in the area, is a bullfrog, but the way to uh, tell which species you have between a green frog and a bullfrog is by looking at, for dorsal lateral fold. So dorsal is back and lateral is side, so kind of that back side area of the frog. If you look there and you find this fold of skin going from the back of the eye to the front of its rear there, you have a green frog. So the green frogs have those on each side of its back. And if you do not see that fold on their back, then it's a bullfrog. Um, these individuals, like I said, occupy permanent ponds, so they need um, large wetlands um, that, that always have standing water all year round uh, so they can um, uh, survive in those areas. But then they also overwinter underwater as well, so green frogs and bullfrogs will uh, stay um, under the water, under the ice, all winter long until until it thaws out, and then they uh, they start hopping around again in the summertime. 
Um, their call, as I think you can hear, sounds like this uh, low resonating twang, low pitched resonating twang, kind of similar to a, a banjo twang is, is how some people will describe it. Um, and you can hear them calling during the day, into the evening, and, and even into the nighttime. Um, so it's, it's quite easy to, uh, to hear them calling during the summer. Uh, they begin in June and continue calling uh, through August, um, as long as temperatures remain uh, somewhat warm. And, uh, and that is the green frog. American bullfrog. This is a species in the family of true frogs. True frogs have the really large, uh, very strong back legs with really muscular thighs. They have extensive webbing between their toes to help them swim. Um, and this is one of the largest frogs. Um, this is the largest frog in Indiana. It can grow to be about eight inches long from the nose to the rear. This is just a juvenile, so it'll get much, much bigger. Um, Another way you can identify the bullfrog is the coloration. They kind of have this brown or greenish or olive green back that's very similar throughout its entire back and its head um, on the legs a little bit as well. Has kind of a wider, broader snout. Um, and it's very similar looking to a green frog like we saw before. But what this frog lacks, what the bullfrog lacks, is that dorsolateral fold. So you can see that it is smooth throughout its entire back. It doesn't have that skin fold that the green frog has that we saw earlier. The call of a bullfrog can be heard all summer long from June through August as temperatures remain warm. And it sounds like a very low pitched, long resonating barum sound. Kind of like the call of a cow or a bull, hence the name bullfrog. Um, you can also hear these guys uh, if you startle them and they're sitting on the banks of a uh, wetland you'll startle them into the water and they will make a alarm call so an alarm call sounds like a very high-pitched squeak or almost a meow and they make this call they jump across the water maybe four or five or six times and then they'll dive down into the water and it's thought that they make this call the alarm call to warn other bullfrogs in the area that a would-be predator is around and that everyone should kind of hop away. Um, and that is the American Bullfrog. So we're here now at Martell Forest, and as you can see behind me, there's this great frog habitat. There are a bunch of green frogs and bullfrogs hanging out in the shallow, marshy area up here. Uh, they just kind of hang out at the surface of the water with their heads out, watching for predators and prey. Um, and we're going to walk along the bank and see if we can startle up some of the bull, bullfrogs so we can hear their alarm call. So we're, we're listening for that high-pitched squeaking and then we will watch them uh, jump across the top of the water, four or five or six big jumps, and then they'll dive in. Dive in. Um, and so we're just gonna walk along the bank and see how this goes.
This is the cricket frog that we found here at Martell Forest um, at this nice permanent pond that's occupied by a lot of green frogs and bullfrogs. But the cricket frog here is actually a member of the tree frogs, tree frog family. So it does have the toe pads that it uses to climb up and down the trees and the surrounding vegetation. The toe pads aren't as large as a gray tree frog or Cope's gray tree frogs will be, but they do still have a little bit of, of suction capability on their toes that they can use to climb around uh, the surrounding vegetation. Uh, some of the distinguishing characteristics of the cricket frog are first the really long slender legs. So they use those long legs for these really, really large jumps. They can actually jump great distances uh, despite their somewhat small size and small um, stature. They also have this copper or reddish to sometimes even a greenish stripe down the middle of their back surrounded by a blackish to brown uh, sometimes even a gray color um, surrounding the rest of their body and their head. Uh, I don't know if you can also see it, but there's always going to be a triangle, typically a black or a dark brown triangle between their eyes that's pointing back towards their rear. And that is a great characteristic. If you can get close enough, it's a great characteristic of the cricket frog to be able to tell you uh, what species it is. Uh, their call is a series of clicks that actually sound similar to snapping two marbles or two pebbles together. And those clicks will start slow and they will increase in rate or repetition as the individual continues to call. They'll call pretty much all summer. Um, feels like he's getting ready to jump. Uh, they'll call typically all summer starting in June and we'll go through um, just about uh, the rest of summer into August. Um, and what's interesting is that this cricket frog, being a, a, a tree frog, will actually occupy the ground and the wetland a lot more often than they will actually occupy the trees. So they also do have a little bit of webbing between their back toes that they use to swim through the water here. And to evade predators, they will jump into the water and swim and blend in. As you can see, the coloration of this frog blends in perfectly with the surrounding uh, habitat and the water. Um, and that is the cricket frog. Okay, so we're back at Purdue University in the lab right now, so I can show you a couple more species from our museum collection of preserved individuals that we weren't able to find out in the wild. So these individuals here were collected previously from the wild to be housed in a natural history museum for the next several decades. Scientists like myself collect specimens of not only amphibians, but also reptiles and fish and birds and mammals to be housed in museums because a physical specimen provides valuable information that scientists can use for experiments as well as conservation efforts. For example, a physical specimen provides a representative record of that species at a particular place at a particular time. Scientists can also use the DNA that is collected from each of these individuals to study their genetics. The Pathogens or parasites can be collected from specimens to measure disease dynamics or disease changes over time. And these individuals make for a great educational tool, which is what we'll be using them for today. So we're gonna zoom in on a couple of these individuals and I can show you the distinguishing characteristics so you can go out into the field and identify them yourselves. So here we have the gray tree frog. Obviously this is a member of the tree frog family. It's the largest and most arboreal tree frog that we have in our state. 
and it's a very representative or very characteristic or typical tree frog when you think of what a tree frog should look like. And by that I mean it's got these long slender legs that it uses to crawl around on and not jump so much but crawl around on the treetops and on branches. And it's also got these large toe pads on the end of each one of its toes. And those large toe pads are what they use to suction to the size of trees or leaves. And they also use those to climb around on houses or on windows as they're foraging for insects that are attracted by the street lights and house lights that are around more urban areas. Some of the distinguishing characteristics of the tree frog beyond the large toe pads and the long legs are the colors. So it's this individual is this dark gray color but they can also be a light gray to almost a white and they can also be even a light green to a dark green. But interestingly enough, tree frogs, or the gray tree frog here, can change colors between that gray and green depending on their mood or on the temperature or humidity. Another great characteristic to identify a tree frog, if you get close enough, is the little white spot right below their eye. So if you can see that little white spot, or it's a much brighter spot right below their eye, then it's kind of a dead giveaway that you have a gray tree frog. So you can look for that little white spot right there. Um, other species, a couple other species will look similar to the gray tree frog, such as the chorus frog or the spring peeper both tree frogs and will have small toe pads but they don't get quite as large as this individual and the toe pads aren't as prominent. The interesting thing about the gray tree frog in Indiana is that we actually have two species of gray tree frogs and they're identical morphologically so we can't look at this individual here and know that we have one of the two species. The two species that we can find here are the gray tree frog and the Cope's gray tree frog. One of the great ways that many people in the field use to identify or distinguish between the two species is their call. So the Cope's gray tree frog will have a higher pitched and faster call. The gray tree frog will have a slower, low pitched and more melodic call. And both of the calls are this repetitive trill that can last anywhere from one to five seconds long. They typically start calling from the trees as they work their way down to the wetlands to breed. And calling occurs from early summer to the middle of summer, ending in about the end of June to early July. And they'll call a little bit during the day, but they'll really peak in the evening or at night where you'll get choruses of frogs calling and it's almost a deafening sound where you can't really hear much else going on. They're calling so loud and so much. Like their name states, they're tree frogs, so they occupy trees pretty much all year round. They'll overwinter in trees, they'll forage for food in trees, and they'll only come down to the wetlands to breed in uh, the beginning or middle of summer. And that is the gray tree frog. Here we have a spring peeper. This is another species in the family of tree frogs that we can find here in Indiana. However, the spring peeper has much smaller toe pads than the gray tree frog and the Cope's gray tree frog. So that means that this species will be crawling around on the substrate or on the soil much more often than it will be climbing on trees. It's actually much less arboreal than the gray and the Cope's gray tree frog. Some of the distinguishing characteristics of this species are its size and shape. So this is a female, and females are larger in spring peepers than the males are. And she's about as large as they come. She's about an inch long. They may get to an inch and a half long from snout to their rear. Um, their coloration, they're typically this dark tan or brown, maybe a little bit lighter tannish brown as well, with a light white belly there. 
uh, but one of the key characteristics is the dark X or an irregularly shaped X on their back and you can see that much better in the accompanying picture there and um, a couple other characteristics are their call so they have a very high pitched and loud peep as their name entails so they will begin calling very early in the springtime in maybe March or April as the temperatures begin to warm. There may even be some snow or some ice on the wetlands as they begin to call. So they're one of the earliest uh, breeders in our area. Um, they will continue calling through about May to early June. So as the, the weather warms and as summer comes around, they will retreat back to the forest and begin foraging around and looking for overwintering sites. And that is the spring peeper. show you how you can add your own data to the scientific community through this free online program called Herp Mapper. There is also a smartphone app for Herp Mapper that allows you to upload the photos and accompanying data straight from your phones as so many people are taking pictures with their phones. So this citizen science program allows you to take your photos or recordings of video or audio and upload them to this online database which can be viewed and analyzed by scientists or science groups that then will track the changes in distribution of these species over time. And by tracking species distributions, scientists and wildlife managers can then be more informed on the current status of these populations and they can then focus their research efforts or conservation efforts if they're seeing that these populations are declining or disappearing from the environment. So we'll get started and to do so we'll just go to the Herp Mapper homepage which I have up here and it is at herpmapper.org. Uh, on the homepage you can see all of the records that have been recorded across the entire world here in this map. A total of 193,629 and just today there have been 75 recordings so it's quite active. Um, so to upload our own data, we first want to log in. And, and if you've not logged in before, you'll first want to register. So in the top right, you'll click Register. Enter in your simple information, creating a username and password. You'll get a confirmation email that will then allow you to log in. And since I am already registered, I'll just hit Log In. My credentials are up, so I'll just hit Sign In. And I can see I'm on my home page, and I have my... Uh, most recent records there, but I want to submit a new one. So to do that, I'll just click submit observation And it'll bring me to this next screen here and the first box I see is vouchers and that is the photo voucher or photograph or video voucher that you want to uh, submit and So I'll just go up here I'll just drag the pictures that I want to submit Right in there and they'll pop right up and I have two pictures of the same individual. These are both of the same green frog. And I am uploading two pictures because they both show a little bit different characteristics that help you to identify that this is a green frog. So it just helps to add to the, to the support that we identify this species more accurately. And it also allows HurtMapper to go back and double check and be more confident that this is the right species identification. So, uh, Feel free to upload videos or a couple pictures or two or three pictures. You can continue adding on uh, to be able to provide as much information that this is the correct species identification. So if we scroll down to the observation details, we can see that some of the data that was attached to the picture has been uploaded here to this details information. Um, so some of it looks filled in. We'll fill in the rest. So these are pictures of the green frog okay and it looks like there are a few options here and I want just the green frog lithobates clamatan so if there are several options it might take a little bit of digging of yourself um, online or in books 
to make sure that you are clicking on the right species because there are some with uh, somewhat similar uh, common names but we want the Lithobates clamatan scientific name that's the one that's in italics so I'm going to click on that Lithobates clamatans the date uh, this was from a couple weeks ago so the date does look accurate and the time looks accurate as well this is an army time um, or military time so uh, I was out at night so that looks accurate the latitude and longitude were also entered in but those do not appear to be accurate so I'm going to zoom out on this map here this is an interactive just like a, a Google Maps or a Google Earth so I'm going to zoom out and it still looks a little confusing I'm not quite able to get my bearings so I'm going to click on satellite and click on labels here and that brings up all of the um, uh, street names and the city names so I'm going to go down here and it looks like it's in this patch of forest here and I come here quite often so I know that the wetland is right in this little patch of trees here so I'm going to click right there and make sure that it updates there and it looks good in the latitude and longitude. It also updated the altitude and accuracy is now zero. And the accuracy essentially gives you an area from this point as to where you think that individual was caught from because we might not have it clicked right on the exact specific spot. So this is recorded in meters so I know that this wetland is about 30 meters in length and so if I've clicked on about the middle I'm going to type in 30 and that gives us a area of that circle that where I think that the frog was caught at or was found at and um, so feel free to, uh, to to make that about as large as you want but also try to make it as accurate as possible uh, the datum or some uh, data that are used for the uh, GPS uh, coordinates was updated and the coordinate source was also updated. The age, this was individual was an adult so I could tell by the yellow throat patch and I did see it calling so the adult um, uh, identification seems appropriate. If you're unsure if it's a subadult or adult or juvenile try to go with your best idea but you can also click on this um, white line or this, this uh, black line here if you're not quite as confident and other individuals at Hurt Mapper can go back in and double check. But I'm going to go to adult, deceased. This may be if you find an individual that was ran over by a car and you want to upload that information onto Hurt Mapper. But this individual was not deceased. Okay, and that appears to be all of the data that I want to input um, hide this record from the public I do not want to do that additional notes um, I don't have anything of note to say but if the individual appeared injured or sick or if there's something else that was interesting if it was uh, exhibiting a strange behavior that you want to mention you can also write that in um, and this is my contact info so this was input already based off of my login credentials then there are two more clicks here. I certify that the location and all information is accurate. And I'm just going to go back and double check that it is. Okay, those are the photographs that I want to upload. The details appear to be correct. And I can click certify. And that I have read and agree with the Hurt Mapper terms of use, which I have done and then click Submit Observation. And it appears that it was submitted successfully. So that's it, it's very simple, just takes a couple minutes. And now that you can identify a lot of the frog species in this area, and you're able to upload that information to the scientific community, I, ho I hope that you'll jump at that chance to do so as often as possible because right now it's especially important that scientists and non-scientists are working together to help conserve wildlife and all aspects of the natural world.